Good morning, and thank you for, for all being here, and thank you to the University of Melbourne for inviting me all the way from New York City to speak at the first ever Swift Posium. I would like to begin today by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. I first started listening to Taylor Swift because of a breakup. I was 16, and my best friend and I were having a falling out for reasons I don't remember anymore. The feelings were heavy and mournful. Having not ever had a breakup of any kind before, losing a friend over something more tangible than time or distance was a devastating experience and a first for teenage me. Before 2009, my experience listening to Swift's music was mostly in passing. I didn't listen to country music at all, and she was already crossing over into the pop sphere I was more familiar with. Our song and later Love Story were in heavy rotation on the music video channels and radio stations I kept on all day. Plus, she was dating my favorite Jonas brother. <laughs> it was hard to not even be a little bit intrigued. For some reason, in the middle of my life as I knew it was exploding, I pressed play on a Tumblr post, of all things, that featured You're Not Sorry, a deep cut off of Swift's second album, Fearless. At that time, I didn't know how to express my feelings to anyone and couldn't grapple the hurt I felt so deeply. There was no personal precedent for it in my life, and I was a quiet, only child who was then better at bottling up my pain rather than expressing it to the people around me. From the opening piano chords, you're not sorry resonate deeply with my emotionally fraught state. You don't have to call anymore. I won't pick up the phone. This is the last straw. Don't want to hurt anymore. You can tell me that you're sorry, but I don't believe you, baby, like I did before. You're not sorry. A bit melodramatic, sure, but I was 16. For about two weeks straight, You're Not Sorry was the only song I listened to. It felt like the only thing tethering me back to reality. It was like Swift was the only person who understood my pain. I wouldn't say I was a full-fledged Swifty just yet. That came later, when I heard All Too Well for the first time. It was like You're Not Sorry on steroids, immediately pulling me back into her universe and making me feel like I'd, I could verbalize what was happening in mine. I was in college when Red came out, studying to be a music journalist at New York University, my writing courses were complemented by a series of music history classes I took in Clive Davis Institute for Recorded Music, a small program for aspiring artists as well as those who wanted to work more behind the scenes in the music industry. Classes on David Bowie, Nirvana, punk rock, and 90s hip hop would help shape my own knowledge and expertise for years to come. I also became quite good at finding the other music-centered courses at NYU outside the program. I took a Joni Mitchell-inspired writing course and later an inter interdisciplinary course on the history of Black Americans in entertainment that used Beyonce's career as a focal point. By the time 1989 was released in 2014, I had graduated and began writing professionally. I covered the album's rollout for Rolling Stone as a freelancer, running around New York attending her launch events and later penning a year in Taylor Swift essay at the end of the year. A decade later, I'm a senior writer at Rolling Stone, about to cover her 11th Taylor Swift album rollout for the magazine, a number that is actually quite insane to try to grasp. Nearly three years ago, around the time Swift released Fearless, Taylor's version, I realized I wanted to try something new. Most of those Clive Davis Institute courses I took in college were taught by music journalists I admired, experts in their field who found a way into academia that made sense for them. I dreamed of teaching a class of my own, one day in the future, when I felt like I could claim expertise on something myself. I was on the programming committee for a conference in America that reconnected me with Jason King, the then head of Clive Davis Institute, who had been my professor while I was a student. I reached out to him outside of the planning meetings to let him know that I felt ready to teach a class of my own in the future, and I asked him how we could make that happen when there was space for me to do so in the program. I expected a long, drawn-out process, as my friends in academia had complained about at their own institutions. I was surprised at his excitement as he asked me to send over a short list of artists or music scenes I would want to teach a class on. In response, I rattled off a few names of pop stars I knew that I could walk into a room full of students the next day and give a three-hour lecture on with little preparation. Taylor Swift was, of course, at the top of that list. Luckily, it was his immediate first choice as well. To our surprise, the class was approved as quickly as I would, and I would be teaching would be approved quickly as well, and I would be teaching for the first time in my life about nine months after the class was first pitched. My first semester as an adjunct professor began in February 2022. It became immediately clear to me how useful this particular class would be for a group of aspiring artists and future la label executives. Swift is the embodiment of the modern music industry, 
and the personification of millennial culture and political history. As I made my syllabus, I began to see the accidental and intentional through lines of her career weave themselves together. When she emerged on the country scene in 2006, George W. Bush was America's right wing Southern president and country music was in a post 9-11 red, white, blue, these colors don't run haze. The Dixie Chicks had been blacklisted from country radio for speaking ill of Bush and his futile war in the Middle East. All women in country began to suffer as a result, with radio slowly and soon entirely prioritizing the genre's men. Swift was the blonde-haired, blue-eyed prodigy singing about crushes and pickup trucks and Tim McGraw that could finally break through. The class pondered the ways the experiences her female heroes had had shaped her approach to her own political identity, or rather lack thereof, for so long. She was also a true millennial, using MySpace to promote her music and connect with her fans. She loved pop music and the emo acts of the time, like Fall Out Boy and Paramore, as much as she loved the very genre of music she was actually making. She fused it all into her songwriting. Crossing over would be easy when she would be ready to leave country music behind, mostly because she'd been crossing over all along. For each lesson, I contextualized Swift's eras into cultural and musical history. Her early years were in tandem with a new wave of proudly purity ring-wearing Disney stars, of which she quickly enmeshed herself with. We analyzed the ways in which her association with explicitly Christian teen idols as a star created the good girl image that, was, that has followed her into her 30s and made any remotely explicit or carnal allusions in her music so shocking or unbelievable to casual listeners. One of my favorite lessons to teach is the one for Reputation Week, where I give an extended history on Kanye West. I hadn't been prepared for how Gen Z listeners did not have context millennial Swifties do for how cool and genius West had once been to many. For my students, West has been a MAGA loser for most of their adolescence, and Swift is a clear winner in their 15-year beef. In further explaining his status at the time of their VMA experience together, the quite overzealous judgment day that befell him in the weeks following, and the racial and gendered implications that color their relationship over the years, it creates a more complicated picture that I love witnessing my students engage with, most for the first time. It was right before our second class on Fearless and Speak Now that news broke of the world's first course on Taylor Swift. Variety wrote a news hit on the syllabus, which went viral mere hours before I saw my students again. I was more shocked than I probably should have been that there was so much interest in the class. That began as a random whim in the final stretch of lockdown restrictions in the U.S. that spurred a hunger in me to break out of my own shell. Press requests inundated my inbox, as well as the inboxes for NYU and even Rolling Stone. I was thrust on TV, had photographers come by and take photos of our class, and journalists interviewing my students. Two years later, I've been brought across the world to Melbourne to speak here at the first ever Taylor Swift academic conference. For me, it was the first hint that the vibe was shifting dramatically around Taylor Swift. 2023 would confirm my suspicions that she had somehow become the most godlike superstar on the planet, bigger than I had thought was even possible. The 1989 level of fame feels minuscule in comparison, and Swift, Swift felt like she was everywhere around then. To me, there was no other reason for the class to go, to go viral. Pop star focused courses was not something I invented. Like I mentioned earlier, I had taken countless classes like this during my college years, and I recall a few courses in Beyonce studies sprouting up in American universities around 2014 as well. It was just as shocking to me, an accidental academic, the wave of other Taylor Swift classes that would soon follow. By the end of the first semester I taught, a few others had been announced at other universities for the fall 2022 semester. Now, institutions like Oxford and Harvard have dipped their, dipped their toes into Swift academics. There will certainly be more in the future, likely taught by the many brilliant minds who have convened in Melbourne this week. Over the last year, I've been asked countless times by friends and strangers what I make of the academic domino effect the class unintentionally set off. Some believe I anticipated this. Others expect me to be peeved. There are many more who use it as an excuse to lament the future of academia, or quote-unquote poptimism, a phrase that I have come to loathe over my years of being a pop music journalist. Their comments often meant mostly to be a knock, to, knock at Swift, with whatever negative feelings they hold against her and her music, often come across as demeaning towards those who have taken her seriously in any form. My main reaction has been baffled, just as I was by the request for news programs to come sit in and fill my 25-person classroom. I wonder often, what do we do with all these Taylor Swift courses, and where do we go from here? From the top of my first class, I encourage my students to be critical listeners. I have been lucky to teach diverse rooms, ranging from superfan Swifties to casual listeners to full-on Swift haters, trying to understand her appeal. I know the range is a product of the program itself, whose aspiring music industry students get roster priority over the rest of the school. But I relish being surrounded by such differences in opinions, and encourage each student 
to challenge themselves beyond their immediate feelings. If you prefer Swift's country music over her pop music, why is that? If you think she is a bad songwriter, what makes her better or worse than the ones you do respect? And if you think she is perfect, why can't you embrace her as flawed? There's a high-mindedness that comes with mass enjoyment and mass hatred that I am careful to avoid. We have such few monocultural moments these days, largely because of how much entertainment consumption is determined by algorithms that allow us to tune out anything that does not match or adhere to our preset tastes and standards. And when something like this particular swift career moment creates a strange universal bond with millions across the globe, it is hard to not want to be part of something bigger than yourself, bonded by friendship bracelets and probably similar origin stories as the one I shared earlier of my own entry point into loving her music. As Swift becomes an increasingly larger part of academia, in ways no one could have anticipated just two years ago, my hope is that these classes and future conferences help mold young listeners into engaged, critical audiences, unafraid of having messy, complicated relationships with any artist they cross paths with, and who understand the broader context of the culture she came up in and was molded by. As we move forward, I also hope the pop academia trend continues to broaden its horizons. More than just Swift focused classes popped up in the months following mine. There were ones taught on Harry Styles, Bad Bunny, Nicki Minaj, and other A list stars with focuses on everything from fandom to literature. There are teachers in the US fearful of the reading comprehension of their younger students, and it could be a revelation in the coming years to see many engage with great, bro- great books and interdisciplinary subjects with the aid of their favorite musicians, helping make them more interested in how crucial this knowledge can be. The last time I taught my class on Taylor Swift, it was one year ago. Our half semester course ended just two weeks before Eras Tour kicked off. It was lucky timing for me and my students before I would have to revamp the entire syllabus and to follow along with Swift's immediately larger than life public persona that came with the tour's early and immediate success. When I teach again in the future, likely next year, I wonder how this will affect the makeup of my class. Will the Clive Davis Institute have converted fully into Eras Pulled Swifties, or will there be a larger contention of haters, distressed by her overexposure? and needing an outlet to vent or understand what the hell has been going on. Regardless, it has never felt like a more prescient class to teach, and I'm certain there will continue being students and fellow professors whose relationship with her may have just started with a fresh heartbreak and the song that made them feel seen. No matter what changes by the end of the year in the greater Swift universe, I'm ready for it. Thank you so much for that, Brittany. I'm sure we all have uh, so many questions to ask you. So um, we'll, we'll start the Q&A now with the audience. So you'll get a chance to ask Brittany any burning questions that you might have. And I've got quite a few from that. <laughs> I'm so curious about everything that's going to go into your new syllabus. Um, does anyone want to kick us off with a question for Brittany? Hello. Um, so you came all the way from the U.S. I'm from Canada, but I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about like different cultural kind of fandom, because I know in the U.S. like that's where she's from. It's kind of insane. And yet here we all are all the way in Australia. So you've traveled a lot to speak about this. Do you have any insights? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I was just in a, at a music conference in Dublin, actually, in October and I was talking with a lot of people there and they said there was such a massive difference in how this uh, the Eras tour had sold out in Dublin versus the Reputation tour um the way that there was much less of that forever even her you know 1989 tour and previous tours um so it does seem like you know in the US she's always been pretty big obviously this is a different kind of big um which seemed impossible especially since 1989 era Taylor was um pretty all-consuming around the time and in the U.S. and I'm sure in Canada as well, where, you know, she was she was everywhere, she was at every show, all the songs were massive hits. Um, but it is quite fascinating that it seems like internationally it sort of dipped or maybe it just never really reached that kind of fervor or, you know, she seems very popular everywhere but obviously has increased over time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think also it's a large part of the country music aspect, I think, again, is such a a big part of where she comes from and that being such a a big genre in the U.S. And it seems like country music has gotten more popular in other countries over the last years. Um, When I had come here in September, I believe Luke Luke Combs had just been on a big stadium tour in Australia. And I remember talking to a lot of people about that. So it seems like country music has gotten even more popular internationally over the years differently in a different way than when Swift first broke that 
maybe allowed um, other country artists to kind of break in a, a different way. But yeah, I mean, it's quite fascinating to see how it's changed and how um, how much more quickly the concerts have sold out internationally than they seem to have been doing before. Thank you. Hello. Um, wonderful speech, by the way. Keynote speech. I'm Jasmine. Um, I was just wondering, with looking at where Taylor started with her career and talking about her country roots with debut back in 2006 and looking at the re-releases of all the albums and debut's kind of like a little bit of like an outlier precursor to all the rest of the eras. What do you, do you have any expectations or desires or thoughts around the cultural impact that the re-release of debut might have being such a full circle moment and seeing people predict it will be the last re-recording? How do you think that's going to fit within how the trajectory of her career has gone and what, I, I guess, what are your expectations or hopes around that re-release of that era for her? Yeah, I mean, I've been kind of expecting that eventually Taylor will go back to country music. We saw some of those teases on Folklore and Evermore, and I feel like the re-release of Fearless kind of hinted that there was a hunger for it again, the the growth of country music, um, both in the, in the U.S. and also internationally, seems to have you know really escalated over over the years and seen a, a lot of kind of newer acts get bigger and kind of allowed like fearless to become as big as it did um but yeah i mean with the the debut album it was you know again like swift standards are different than other pop standards so it it was less successful than her other albums but that's because it was a debut album obviously it took longer to kind of get that reach and build that fandom and kind of um you know, create uh, more of that buzz around her. Fearless, of course, was the really big breakthrough because song like Love Story and You Belong With Me were such massive crossover hits. So I think there's going to be kind of a return. I feel like a lot of people rank debut low um, because it is so, like it is really her only very, very country album. I think, again, by the time we get to Fearless, she's already testing out pop music and, and experimenting with that. But um yeah, I, I feel like there might be kind of a, a renaissance in that. I think might allow her to maybe want to, you know, maybe do a, a return to country for a little bit, maybe try that out um, again and kind of revisit it. I'm also assuming that the Volt tracks are going to have a lot of really great features. I would be very upset if Tim, Gra Tim McGraw is not on a Volt track. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it was really great of her to kind of include a lot of country acts on Fearless and Red, which were, um, you know, two of her other country album or read, read, you know, a mix of things, but having like Keith Urban and Chris Stapleton on, on Maren Morris on those albums obviously shows that we can, we can get a lot of great country features on, on debut as well. Brittany, thanks so much for being here. It's uh, really exciting to hear from you. I've got a question about, I guess, your role as an entertainment journalist, and I'm wondering what you and your colleagues um, take on this might be. I'm really curious about the way that, uh, Taylor kind of self-canonizes in a way and uh, and engages with her canon. And um, something, just to give an example of this, I remember from, I think it was her Tiny Desk performance, where she was talking about uh, All Too Well and how the story of it becoming a fan favourite track and how it would appear on, you know, her, her ranking lists and stuff like that. It felt very clear to me that she was talking about the Rolling Stone list. Um, so I wonder what you and your colleagues take on that is, whether you feel that she is reading and uh, keeping up on things, whether it's a symbiotic and uh, productive and dialogue um, from your perspective. Yeah, I, I feel my, my biggest thing with Taylor, and this is it, I think why I, I'm such a fan of her music and kind of of that self-mythologizing aspect of her to a degree. The Easter eggs are a bit much for me. <laughs> kind of draw the line there. But, um, you know, I, I think she's such a nerd. And I think that is a big part of it. And I think our greatest artists are huge nerds. I think the reason why her and Beyonce are had two of the biggest tours last year is because they are both massive music nerds. They are extremely referential. They care deeply about music history. They care deeply about who preceded them and what happens after them. Um, and you see that in their performances in the way that they interact with, um, you know, legendary artists that they, they love. Um, thinking about Beyonce's Tina Turner tribute at the Grammys or thinking about, um, you know, Taylor doing a, a Carole King song at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or Taylor doing an interview with Patti Boyd, who is... A, a rock and roll muse that I'm sure many of her younger fans had never heard of before, but Taylor's entire music is about 
a mu- about muses inspiring her and um, do- interviewing one of the greatest rock and roll muses of all time is a great a nerdy move, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think they both care about that self-mythologizing and Taylor is very explicit with it in um, the way that she does it because as opposed to someone like Beyonce, she is talking more. She's kind of more vocal about sort of creating that and engaging with her fans in that way. Um, and she's really very knowledgeable of what is happening around her, how people talk about her. There's a mix of mythology that she's self-created. Of course, we have like the liner notes that she had done um, in her, when, you know, people bought more CDs and read liner notes, you know, that was a big part of it. The lucky number 13, all of that. The fans were very quick to engage with that and, and love that about her. So she's played with it even more. She's obviously ramped up the, the way that she engaged with the Easter eggs and creating these through lines and threads thinking about um, like an album like Midnight's where she is so explicitly connecting songs from or moments from her past to new music and creating kind of these, um, these invisible strings. Well, they're not really invisible, Uh, (laughs) but like between her current present day music and her past. Um, So yeah, I feel like she's very hyper aware of that world around her, how the people, how people engage with her. She wants to be, this is why she's so active um, she was so active on MySpace when she first started. That's why she was so active and has been active on Tumblr and engaging with her fans and reading everything. That's why she's active on TikTok. She's watching the videos. She's like making reference to the language, like and the lingo for better or worse, you know, <laughs> and like she's engaging with it. And of course she's reading articles and she's, she knows how people are talking about her and how people talk about other artists like her and kind of how ev- all of that works. Um, so yeah, she's a, I think to be a savvy kind of, business woman in the industry, you have to be a huge nerd and you have to care about that. And a big part of being a legendary musician is having a mythology around you. Um, And I think that she's been very good at letting that kind of organically happen, but then also encouraging it when it needs to happen. Thank you. Um, We've got a question over here. While we get the mic to you, I've got a question for you um, as a fellow teacher about engaging your students. You talked about a little bit about Kanye and that you know a lot of your students didn't actually have the context of who Kanye was in the years previous but also that you have to teach some swift haters as well in your class and that you think there might be some more and you mentioned a few sort of questions that you might turn back on them but I'm interested to know how you sort of engage the students with the subject material if maybe they don't have the context or if they're a little bit reluctant with it as well. Yeah I mean to the point of um, you know having people with differences of opinions, I very much encourage that in my classroom. I love that. I think that's a big part of um, any sort of cultural moment. I think it's so important for people to engage with that. I think, um, you know, we had very sort of like very friendly kind of arguments over albums, you know, even like the the huge, the Swifties were um, in the class were kind of arguing over like whether Reputation is a good album, or whether Lover is a good album. And then the, the fans who maybe didn't listen to her as, or the people in the class who didn't really listen to her before, or, um, didn't have a lot of context or were finding things that they enjoyed or kind of being able to verbalize more the parts of her music that don't appeal to them. Um, and I think that's so important, especially again, for the context of the school that I'm teaching and it's aspiring musicians who I'm hoping kind of are able to engage with, um, what about her has worked as a, as an artist and what doesn't work for them as an artist or um, what they enjoy and kind of want to emulate. But yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I, this is the first class I've ever taught and I'm hoping to teach other classes in the future, but I think it was so fascinating to learn what needed context and like what the differences are between um, millennial and Gen Z listeners and kind of our experiences with music history um, and kind of what the things that I maybe, um, thought were like common knowledge, but are actually kind of lost in, in the shuffle of things. I think another example um, was discussion of feminism in pop music was a big one that for many of my students, for I mean, for all of my students, being a, a public figure and calling yourself a feminist has been a, a part of their lives the entire time they've been aware. And for them, they did not realize that prior to 2014 or 2013, um, you know, there weren't many major pop stars who claimed feminism, um, that it was a huge deal when, you know, someone like Beyonce is on stage with, uh, the word feminist behind her at the VMAs. Like that was newsworthy. That was something that was on the, like there were articles written about it for months. Um, you know, and for Taylor Swift to claim it for, um, you know, it's a big deal that Lana Del Rey 
you know, was kind of had a complicated relationship with it. You know, there are all these artists who um, were so, it was, it was seen as a kind of, you know, radical thing to be a feminist. It was seen as like, you're a independent artist, punk rock, like feminist. If you're, you can't be like a girly pop star and call yourself a feminist. And a lot changed around the time that Taylor released 1989 that sort of shifted her own perception relationship with it. So it's really fascinating to have that conversation with my students where I was like, oh yeah, like this is something that I have to contextualize that I didn't realize, um, you know, because it feels so recent to me um, that that shifted, that for them it was kind of their entire conscious experience with pop culture is that every artist has been a feminist that they love and calls themselves feminist all the time and uses it to varying degrees of accuracy of the, um, you know, definition of feminism. But, you know, I, I think it's stuff like that I think is really interesting and um, kind of allows us to have a better um, and more thorough picture of modern pop culture and modern music history. That's so interesting. Thank you so much. I always feel so old, even though the gap between my students, I mean, it seems to get bigger every year, but, you know, what what we might know from millennial pop culture history versus Gen Z culture history yeah. is really interesting. And that idea of the girl's girl uh, is really, really strong with yeah. a lot of my students, whereas when we were growing up, that probably wasn't necessarily, that was sort of, you're an exception if you were a girl's girl. So I think that culture shift has really happened, which is very interesting. Yeah, I, I told them about the, how everyone called themselves humanists for a long time. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and they all, like, the look of disgust on their faces when I was like, everyone was like, I'm not a feminist, I'm a humanist. They were like, what is that? <laughs> and I was like, you would not believe what was happening when I was the same age as them in college, like a decade ago, you know, it's like really wild. So it's it's very funny to explain it. It is. It's, gr it's great to see. It's great to see as well. Another audience question. Yes, we've got one down here. Uh, building off the previous question, um, coming into your class, you're saying you have some, you know, hardcore Swifties and also like Swift haters. And she's such a divisive person where you have these reactive responses. And so what is it like navigating that in terms of like the first few weeks versus the end of the course? And are there particular turning points that kind of happens with both parties? Yeah, I, I think with um yeah, with both both sides of it, I try to encourage them to explore a more complicated relationship. So I think with the people who don't listen to her as much <clears throat> or don't like her music as much or believe that they are not fans of her, you know, kind of trying to see if kind of break through sometimes there is internalized misogyny that they sort of realize that they have about her lyrics and about the breakup songs. And we're like, okay, like but every pop song is a is a breakup song, you know. <laughs> like it's like, but why why are hers specifically um, offending you, you know? And also engaging with the hardcore Swifties of like, you know, it's okay to disagree with her politics. It's okay to um, let people not like an album, or if a if a review is something that you know, if there's an album review they don't agree with, that's not violence against Taylor or against their own fandom. That it's okay for people to have a difference of opinions. Um, it doesn't ruin your experience of the music and to be okay with feeling that, um, th that uncomfortableness that comes with maybe uh, realizing that your favorite artist is not perfect or um, not aligned with you in totality. So, you know, I, I think by the end of the class, it is so fascinating, especially when I get the final papers, you know, I, I see so much, so many interesting things of like, you know, artists or and I remember in the very first semester I taught, there was one student, um, and he had not listened to much of Taylor's music. He just, he's a singer, he was a singer songwriter and he just kind of was curious about her, her music and was like, you know, this seems like a fun class to take. And like, I'm a songwriter. So like, she seems like someone worth kind of studying as a songwriter. By the end of the class, he wrote about the track fives. His paper was about track fives. I was like, well, where did we, how did we get here? <laughs> I was like, you knew nothing about her. And suddenly you're writing about like, you know, sort kind of deep cutty fan theories. So, um, stuff like that is is really kind of fascinating or producers who maybe didn't totally um get her music kind of being able to do a really close analysis of production and um right you know finding the the things that they connect with um from their own discipline and background and um you know and still i mean you know they don't have to leave the class a super fan they don't have to leave the class feeling like less of a fan so i think that's also important but um you know i think connecting with her deeper than just like i love her or i hate her is important with any music artist. And, uh, you know, I think allowing that complicatedness is, is so valuable in the class. So I think we have some questions from our online audience. So I'm just going to pivot to Olivia. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, we have two questions from online. Um, I'll do the first one first 
from Miriam Wallace. Sorry for mispronunciation. Um, Miriam says, Brittany, I'm a big admirer of your work and draw great inspiration from your career as a music journalist in the pop world. Can you go through some of the challenges that you face teaching that course when it comes to catering to a diverse classroom of students? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think the biggest challenge came in the first class of sort of figuring out what was needed for it, you know, like what um, what I can bring to talk about an artist that all of them have experienced their entire lives. Like when I was taking these classes in college, it was mostly older artists who weren't active anymore. You know, um, it was a David Bowie class. And for that, that was just, you know, there was at that when I took the classes right before he started releasing music again. So it was like everything we were talking about was like decades prior. Um, and, you know, I think kind of navigating how to talk about her as she's active, as things are changing constantly, as there's fan theories. Um, also grappling with fan theories, I think has been a big part of the class. Um, and, you know, there was a huge difference between the first time I taught the class in 2022 to 2023 with like students who were very deeply entrenched in like Gaylor theories by 2023 um, and kind of discussing, you know, sort of the difference between um, intention and interpretation in fan theories, I think is really valuable and important. And I think um, kind of, you know, allowing them to have a, a broad picture where they can have a, a reading of an artist, but also kind of understand that their reading may not always match the intention of an artist, um, I think has been sort of the, I guess, one of the more difficult parts of teaching it, of kind of being like, I don't know that it's, you know, it's gay baiting. <laughs> like, it's like we have to be more, we have to have like a broader view of it um, in that way and kind of allow that person to exist in a, uh, the context that they present themselves as and still have, you know, can still have fun with with theories and our own inter and like personal readings of it. So that's, I think the, the fan theory stuff has been sort of the most difficult part. Other than that, like it's been pretty kind of, um, you know, with that wide range of, of students, pretty fun and, and great to kind of teach them and, and find ways to connect all of them. Thank you. We do have one more online question. So um, um, we'll have one more question or two because Catherine Robb has put in a second part while we've been talking. So her first question was, would it be possible to ask, uh, sorry, this question, um, apart from being a singer-songwriter, Taylor has also engaged in acting, directing, among other things. How have these different activities influenced her career and do you think they have positively influenced or detracted from her work as a musician? And I'll just quickly see if the second part is related. Um, could you let us know why you think Taylor has managed to stay relevant for different ages? I'm 34 and now there are teenagers engaging with her music and finding just as much power in her lyrics and sound. Could you give us a bit of insight? So two things there, um, one about her sort of expanding career outside of music and the relevance of that and I suppose also taking back to the intergenerational interest. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for, you know, every every musician and pop artist, like I think they're um, – always comes a time where they expand outside of what they're creating as a musician. Um, we've had so many uh, artists kind of explore directing or producing or writing for others or, um, you know, acting and things like that. So, you know, I think for for Taylor, she, I, I mean, some of her acting roles have been <laughs> confusing. But, um, but, you know, I think with directing her videos more, obviously that it plays into the, the bigger part of owning her music and have this kind of, um, you know, this actual sort of control over the image and what she's creating and how she's, you know, how people perceive that and how they engage with it. Um, so, you know, I, th I think it's a very kind of common thing with any artist and um, does speak to her own sort of creativity and kind of creating the mythology and creating kind of the um, crafting the image overall. And to why she's kind of continued to be, be so popular and continue to reach younger audiences, I think a big part of that is she's always been so engaged with her fandom. Um, you know, again, the, the social media aspect is something that is very unique for her. I think she's someone who, you know, we've seen artists from her era and prior to her era who have kind of stepped away from social media. We've seen people like, um, you know, like someone like Lady Gaga was much more active on Twitter. And obviously, like, Little Monsters were one of the first big kind of Twitter stand communities and she's, you know, she's kind of stepped away from it. That was like her real, like it was her big connection. She doesn't do it as much anymore. We've seen a lot of artists um, kind of close off from those after a while. 
and, you know, someone like Harry Styles too, like, you know, One Direction was very active with like, you know, they had like the, the Twitch chats and they um, followed everyone on Twitter and things like that. And we've seen him sort of step away more and more um, and kind of create a little bit more of a, a wall between his public image and his personal life. Um, so I, I think with Taylor, that wall <clears throat> has just um, kind of shifted a little bit. You know, there is some of that separation, but her music has always been diaristic. She's always singing from a very personal place. It's hard to completely put up that wall when that's such a big part of how she um, crafts her image as a, as a musician. But also she is very good at sort of self-marketing. You know, like she's very good at TikTok exists instead of being a millennial artist who does not engage with TikTok and kind of lets the label take care of her TikToks. She's on there posting like, you know, homemade videos of her like getting ready to go to her like NYU, um, to the NYU graduation. And like, that looks like every other NYU grads kind of like video, of, like getting ready and like in the car to the stadium and all of that. Um, you know, she's commenting on, on videos. She's engaging with people. She's like, she's really active in it in a way that's like so fascinating that she doesn't have to do, um, but she still chooses to do it and seems to understand kind of the in jokes that are happening and, um, you know, makes references to them. Like, you know, even on Tumblr, like, didn't she, I think she had like a hashtag that was like five holes in the fence or something after that kind of had blown up in the fandom, you know, it, it's stuff like that. Like she's so good at that kind of, um, intuitive marketing and, and, um, connection with her fans that I think has helped her translate from, 2006 to now of still engaging with people. Wonderful. Um, we have a question over here and then I can see another couple of hands. I've noted them. I'll come to you next. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so this is actually pulling off of that idea of Taylor Swift as a singer songwriter. Um, like we are very used to the idea of the singer songwriter with men, right? Like Lennon McCartney, Bob Dylan, who got a Nobel prize for literature. Uh, Leonard Cohen and all of his poetry. And with female singer-songwriters, they usually come out of the alternative scene, right? Your Patti Smiths, Stevie Nicks, who, amongst us, has not been seeing Silver Springs, right, all over their TikTok for the last little, oh, 97 was a good year. Um, so how do you think it is that Taylor Swift has managed, as a singer-songwriter in pop, I guess, is the space that I'm looking at here? Because we usually associate the female singer-songwriter with the alternative scene. I wonder if this is because of her country music roots and that idea that country music is like three chords and the truth. Rolling Stone interview, 75, of course. Um, Harlan Howard, I think, said that. So, yeah, I was wondering, how do you think that she has managed to maintain that status as a singer-songwriter in a pop scene? And do you think she'll get the same sort of respect as male singer-songwriters in pop currently do? Yeah, I, I think the country music part is a big, big part of that. I think country music is built on um, being a singer-songwriter, and um, that is the entire, you know, Dolly Parton, um, the Chicks, like, Reba McIntyre, you know, all these artists are are songwriters, and I think that is, that's the scene that, she's come, that she came up in. Um, that is the authenticity that is assumed to be brought by a person in that genre. Um, and so having such a big, you know, she had, kind of four albums that were um, either explicitly country to or um, majority country that she released. And the songwriting, working with country songwriters with um, people like Liz Rose and Nathan Chapman, um, that's a, a big part of, I think, that. And I think with the pop music, you know, it, it, it has been fascinating to see her kind of more so emphasize the songwriting aspect of her. Um, or like, I guess, keep it at the forefront of the conversation in a way that we don't allow pop artists to have. Um, we see this constantly where pop artists are um, assumed to not be songwriters. You know, I, I've seen a million times that people have taken away credit from someone like Madonna for her songwriting. And Madonna is an excellent songwriter and she's written um, many of her albums. And because she's a pop star and because she's Madonna, that is assumed that she doesn't do that. Um, Mariah Carey, the conversation of her songwriting has only become a bigger part of the conversation in the last five years. She wrote All I Want is for Christmas is You. It's Im impossible to write a Christmas song that good that becomes part of the canon after like the 50s, you know? <laughs> like It's like pretty insane that she was able to do that in her 20s and um, make one of the biggest Christmas songs of all time and, and wrote it herself. And so, you know, there's a lot of pop artists where that credit is taken away. But I think Taylor 
again, because of the, the nerdy aspect of her, is um, she's, she knows how people have treated her heroes, and she is very knowledgeable of it. She's written a lot of songs about that. Um, you know, she's written a lot of songs about how her heroes die alone or her heroes kind of lack this respect. And um, she's thought critically about kind of what happens to people and women as they age and get older and in pop music and in, and in any genre and in the entertainment industry. So, you know, I, I think that she's been very good at making sure that even as she transitioned from country to pop music, that there is no credit ever taken away from her as a songwriter. You know, this was when she worked with Max Martin, someone who's known for writing songs for pop artists more than writing songs with pop artists. She always was very clear that her reason to go to him and to work with him was to learn from him um, and to work with him. She wasn't going to let that credit be taken away or to be seen as a, a pop star who's interpreting music by a great pop songwriter. She is a great pop songwriter who decided to have a joint slay with another great pop songwriter. Um, so, you know, I think she's been very good at emphasizing that in her own, in part of that building that self mythology. And I think we're already seeing a lot of credit being given to her now um, in a way that we have not seen her heroes be given in their heydays. Um, you know, again, like the, conversation about people like like Joni Mitchell, Carly Simon, um, Carol King has only seen them as truly, truly great in the twilight of their careers. Or we wait until people are dead or women are dead um, to give them that respect. And I think things like this, our classes, um, you know, I, I think has allowed people to give a newfound respect to her um, and to be able to celebrate that now. I think we're seeing that more now with um, artists of her generation that we didn't see with their heroes, and I think that's important. We don't. We should not wait until people are retired or dead or not releasing music. I mean, it's pretty incredible the type of run that Taylor's had um, the last several years of releasing new music and re-recording her music. Um, we should celebrate that as legendary in the time that it's happening. Um, I don't like. I don't. I don't think it's fair to wait until she's like, you know. 80 and like someone like Joni Mitchell is like going to the Grammy, performing at the Grammys for the first time. Like that's insane. Mm. You know, <laughs> why, why is that the first time that Joni Mitchell's performed at the Grammys? Um, so yeah, I think it's important to kind of celebrate that now. Thank you so much, um, Brittany. I wanted to ask a question um, that relates to something that came up at the end of our public panel last night on feminism in the music industry. And it was about Taylor's, Taylor's feminism as kind of white feminism and, you know, she's been this character that's been at times deployed by the right as this kind of Aryan white figure and she's resisted that. And we've got a paper on that at the conference. Um, we've got a few streams exploring um, uh, race and questions of coloniality and Taylor. But I wanted your perspective on this. Like, how well do you think she's navigated that territory of these kind of questions, especially with that history with Kanye as well? Um, and she's surrounded herself now by kind of people of colour as her, her backing dancers mainly. Like, how well do you think she's doing that? Like, what's your critical take on on her kind of white feminism, I suppose? I think she's handled it medium well. I think <laughs> that, um, you know, again, the context of her and politics of, is, again, being a country artist who came up post every woman in country being blacklisted um, and her favorite band being um, the most blacklisted because they spoke out. Um, and a lot of artists have spoken. Um, there's a great book called Her Country by Marissa Moss, um, who's a, another writer for Rolling Stone, that has a lot about that um, experience of artists like she interviewed like Casey Musgraves and Maren Morris and um, you know talked with them about the fact that they felt... Um, scared to kind of enter the genre and to, to talk. And of course, Taylor came up before them and um, became extremely popular before them and um, suddenly was very thrusted as the face of country music at a time when there were no other women being allowed on country radio. Um, so I do feel like that colored a lot of the way that she's not, she's been apprehensive of talking about politics, um, even when people wanted to align her with very right-wing views. Um, you know, I ultimately think it. she took too long to talk about it. But, you know, I think I have a complicated relationship with with celebrities and politics and, and listening to them. But I do think it is of value for artists to speak out um, 
on, you know, major issues and what's going on, especially in the U.S. and especially in this election year um, that we're about to have, which, you know. Um, but, yeah, I think it is, you know, I think with her own whiteness and with kind of the white feminist aspect of her, I think it's, um, I don't know, I don't think any white artists have been very good at engaging with that in a real way, you know, and, uh, you know, when like artists are, are accused of appropriation, they get very defensive. Um, you know, when they are, when there's conversations about the way that black artists have been erased, you know, there's not a lot of white artists who speak up. We're seeing younger artists do that. A lot of Gen Z artists are much better at being political and um, engaging with that. But millennial artists seem to have a very complicated relationship with being honest about those things and allowing themselves to be at fault. Um, I don't really know what that is, but, yeah, I mean, I you know, I would like to see more from anyone um, and from her and all that. But, you know, I don't know. I, I've, again, I have a very, it's more of a personal thing. It's not really like a kind of, you know, I'm like, uh, no celebrities are going to align with me politically. So I just kind of have to acknowledge that. And especially as a, a, a black fan of Taylor Swift, I think it's always going to be kind of confusing to people why I like her music and connect with her music. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I'm answering your question because I feel like it's kind of like a, messy topic that I'm still kind of figuring out for myself and <laughs> trying to figure out kind of like what I expect and need for my artists. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think that, yeah, I was, I was very impressed that she, when the Black Lives Matter protests had speak out, begun in the U.S., um, she did speak out pretty quick, quickly and um, kind of shared the history of Juneteenth on her Twitter. And I was very shocked that she did that as quickly as she did. Um, I'm hoping to see more from her in that way in the future. I hope that wasn't the only thing. I'm curious what's going to happen with the election because Donald Trump is already trying to claim her. Um, literally just today, there was an article coming out about him being like, I've made so much money for her. Um, and, you know, I'm curious what's going to happen with that. Um, and it's going to be a really interesting year to see how she engages with politics overall and kind of her image as, again, being the very all-American girl, which all American in America is white. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm curious how she's going to do more of that. And I'm hoping for more from her. Hi, Brittany. Um, thanks so much for this. Um, I was wondering, uh, obviously you were at the Grammys and, uh, you know, Taylor taking home the fourth album of the year win. She's been breaking a lot of records that I think are going to be quite hard to match for any artist sort of contemporary or um, sort of to follow. And there's already a lot of oh, we're so sick of Taylor and she's winning too many awards. And, um, you know, even in Australia, I think the top five albums right now are all Taylor Swift albums. Like she's completely dominating both, I guess, from a mainstream success and also sort of critically. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that success and I guess her legacy and, um, yeah, how, how you think that's kind of going to go over the next few years and how we're going to remember her in that sort of way. And if you do think she's at a level that just is so far, <laughs> you know, um, in the stratosphere right now that, that yeah, she's kind of in that sort of league of her own. Yeah, yeah I mean, we um, we just we have so few times like this now. Like we, it's, it used to be obviously more common, for better or for worse, you know, in terms of having kind of this like all-consuming pop cultural moments, kind of like thriller-esque um, you know, Madonna impersonator, Beatlemania, like Elvis, like all that kind of stuff. Like, and that's a, a product of music and music consumption changing. And that in and of itself is so exciting because we can see artists who, um, you know, otherwise would have been kind of shafted by the music industry or by, you know, music sales or things like that find great success. But Taylor has obviously gone above and beyond in the way that she's connected with everyone in the way that, um, the globe has really taken to her in the past couple of years and again, bigger than anyone could have imagined. Cause that seemed like she had reached sort of that, that higher stratosphere of, um, pop culture omnipresence long before here, but long before this moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think backlash is inevitable for any major artist that happens constantly. Um, I think any artist who, and especially for women, you know, it's like once you kind of reach a certain point and you, are seen as very powerful, it's very easy for people to get to that sort of like, well, enough of her. We've seen enough, too much of her. Um, we saw that again, like after 1989, um, when she had reached that that peak in particular, the backlash happened. Um, and even Taylor had said on the, on the phone call with Kanye that she was like, I'm risking overexposure. Like she's aware of those things. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of, I feel like I don't really have any sort of specific prediction of what's going to happen in the next few years. Cause I'm surprised that it's the backlash is like, it's almost taken longer than I anticipated it would take, mm-hmm. you know, because people, she is so divisive and people kind of like, you know, either really love her or really hate her. Um, but she seems to be in a moment where more people love her than like truly hate her. And even like the, the conversations around her have changed so much, even like having such a public relationship, thinking about what that conversation would look like, like, you know, in a decade ago, I guess, like where people have been like, can't wait for the breakup album. Like, can't wait for her to write a song about how much she hates him. And people are like excited about it. Like they, she's, they're like the Royal couple in the U S right now. Like, and, you know, that's like so new for how people engage with her. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of curious, like what's going to happen with it. I mean, I think even again, like the, like the football backlash backlash feels almost fake to me. Like that doesn't feel like real backlash. Um, like having experienced like real Taylor Swift backlash and covering it, like that's like chump change, you know, it's like a bunch of football fans being annoyed about something. They're always annoyed about something. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's kind of fascinating. I'm curious. I also feel like she's kind of like, um, like a method promoting reputation almost in a way where I'm like, I think she's just trying to get to a place where like she's overexposed again and then reputation really hits hard. Um, <laughs> but cause it almost felt like that was 1989 where I was like, okay, she's gotten like even bigger than ever. 1989 TV drops. Like, um, I don't know. I, I think it, it's, she might, but she might be immune to it at this point. Who knows? Um, or it could come in a really extreme way that we may have never anticipated in, um, anything could really happen right now. But, you know, I think as long as, you know, hopefully, you know, I'm hoping to- Tortured Poets Department is great. I'm sure it'll be a really great album. Um, I think as long as the music speaks for itself, I think that's going to be the thing that carries her. Cause that's the reason why she's bigger than ever right now. I mean, she folklore evermore midnights were incredible, trio of original albums that she released kind of back to back on top of the re-records, which had excellent bolt tracks on them. Um, you know, I, I think the music has been so powerful that it's uplifted that public persona and that goodwill towards her. Um, so that even the backlash feels kind of small in comparison. We might have a couple more questions in the room. I think we've got one over here. Um, I just have a question, and it was kind of going back a question or two earlier, um, just about how how perhaps um, Taylor responds to moments where she's criticised for her white feminism. Um, and, I th- and what comes to mind for me is uh, when she originally put out the Folklore album and the label and the tag that she had um, when she was kind of called out for it, she reacted, she made a... Um, she made a payment, she kind of changed the label and then when it came to dating Maddie Healy and then she was like, oh, I'm going to bring on Ice Spice for my Karma release kind of thing and it was, it's all very reactionary sometimes and I just wonder if, is she always reactionary or perhaps maybe she could be more proactive in that kind of space where like if we see her reaching out politically and we see her saying, oh, this person in particular, maybe you want to vote for, or we don't like this person's values. Like, where is she being proactive and where is she perhaps being more reactionary? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, again, such a specific symptom of being a millennial superstar where the um, it's either ignoring it or being reactionary. And I think it's a common theme with a lot of artists of her of her era where it's like, sometimes it's better to just um, either not like, you know, let the thing pass and kind of hope people kind of forget about it or like get very defensive about it. Um, So yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of, again, almost sort of now old school kind of way of handling um, your own sort of publicity and own public image. And um, Taylor obviously is coming from that where it's like, because she is so big, it's either, you know, it's like comes to a point where it's like, she's probably thinking like, what's the point of me putting out a statement to talk about this? Or what's the point of me doing this and saying like, you know, denouncing my boyfriend or denouncing this, like when I can just kind of, you know, have save face with like maybe the song or something or do something like this. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's, again, like, it's not the best way to approach it. (laughs) And um, I think people are still kind of figuring out how to kind of navigate those moments and in a way that's, like, real and and kind of true and not just, like, 
throwing um, money at a situation or kind of um, getting defensive against it. But at the same time, I wonder if it's also just kind of like what actually is going to be enough for to make those moments right um, is probably what a lot of those artists like Taylor think in those kind of moments where they're being more reactionary or kind of ignoring a, a kind of major um, controversial plot point in their own careers and images. But yeah, I don't know. I think her, I, I'm curious how she will navigate those in the future when she does more interviews or kind of puts them in songs or in moments like that. Like I, I feel like we haven't, you know, she did the time interview, but that was the first interview she had done in years. Um, I'm curious what's going to happen when she is, she used to obviously be very vocal and, and do a lot more interviews and things like that. So I'm curious what's going to happen in the future um, when those moments kind of come back and she maybe has to confront them in a real way um, and talk about them in a real way. And, you know, I'm hoping that we don't lose that forever in the way that we've lost again with a lot of artists from, um, <clears throat> from our era <clears throat> who don't do interviews as much anymore or don't, um, don't talk or don't respond at all to any kind of controversies. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things where you kind of reach a point of being so big that it's either just like you can, you can get kind of defensive and, and make it seem like that's enough or just ignore it entirely and pretend like it'll wash away. Um, and do we have some questions from online? We have one from Caroline Bolland who asks, if there is a time for another question, what role do you think her origin story and how our perception and knowledge of it has changed over time plays in her career relevance and impact? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, obviously when she was in country, she was leaning <clears throat> very much into um, the Christmas tree farm and that kind of like small town girl aspect. Obviously, not all of that is like totally... Um, the most accurate way to kind of portray her own coming up. I mean, her dad is like a hedge fund, man, I don't know, finance stuff, but hedge fund manager or something. Um, all this, you know, there's her mom's from financial background, like all that kind of stuff is, um, you know, more accurate way of depicting her. But of course, when you're a country music artist, you have to present yourself as very like from a small town, like kind of from like humble roots. Um, you know, there is that sort of like uh, kind of, smallness that you have to embrace when you are doing that genre and something that she's able to as a pop artist not have to emphasize so much now um or try to kind of pretend is is smaller than it actually was um but yeah I think that it's kind of fascinating how um kind of the expectations of for that particular genre that she came up in and how she kind of leaned into it of course like there's the the accent that has like disappeared <laughs> you know and like the um you know She's like from Philly. Like there's no, no one has a Southern accent in Philly. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious kind of like where, I don't know. I guess she doesn't really have to talk about the origin as much anymore because the origin doesn't matter. Um, she's so deep into her career now. Like there's no real need for her to answer it as much, um, answer for it or talk about it. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's kind of, she's almost has like this rebirth with every album and with every era now that sort of like a new origin story kind of pops up of like, you know, like the tortured po poet's origin is the idea of like, you know, this breakup and kind of what's happened with it and kind of creates a whole new kind of narrative that she's sinking into and that people are kind of starting fresh and starting anew from um, and maybe rethinking other music because of. So, so yeah, I think, and I mean, I guess that's also the same of any like, popular artist who's been around for a long time where, that origin story becomes less and less of a, an important aspect um, over time. Okay, I think we're going to close out there. I think we've had some really wonderful questions from everyone. Thank you so much for your contributions and let's give Brittany a big thank you. Thank you.